we always start out with giving you guys a chance to talk about your journey into education and into your current position because it's always really interesting for these guys to hear all the different ways that we all end up where we're at. Um, yeah, and then they have questions that they have written, yeah. so they kind of take it from there, and if they're jotting things down, it's just because they have to write a paper. Mm-hmm. After. Yeah. So. Yeah. I know. Paper? I know. All right. All right, so yeah, go ahead. Do you want me to start? Yeah. Mine. Probably longer. longer than mine. I was like, mine's probably longer because I did not start out going into teaching. Yeah, you have a good point. Um, so when I was in school, I had always wanted to teach, but I also knew it wouldn't make me much money. So therefore, I did not go into teaching right away. Um, I instead actually started out as a poli sci major doing political science because um, I also really loved law and history and those sorts of things. Still love case law. It's probably one of my favorite things to study in grad school. Um, but Then I switched gears because I got hired at a bank in college um, to work as a teller and really liked the business world, so I switched and did a business major instead. Um, Did all of that and was in banking and actually did very well in banking. I worked for Wells Fargo, um, worked my way up to be a bank manager um, by the time I was about 25. Um, And that is when the financial crisis was hitting. So it was a really fun time to be in banking because nobody could afford houses. Nobody could afford much of anything, and it was just a tough time for lending. Um, The Wells Fargo world got pretty tight in terms of um, their expectations, and so I just wasn't really loving it. It was a lot of stress. I spent probably 12 hours a day at the bank, um, and I was like, I can't do this anymore. I've got two little kids. I need something different. Um, Went down to work at the college, actually. I worked at BCSU in the business office. Um, Really loved working there, but the teaching thing kind of kept calling my name again and again and again. Um, I would go in to teach classes to kids about their finances, about loans, about being smart with credit, and it just felt really natural and good, and I had a couple of the teachers I would come into that was like, you should really go back and do your teaching degree. Um, So I decided to try a couple of classes, um, and there was a teacher that I had, a professor that I had, and I felt like I was not doing a good job, I just didn't think this was for me, Um, and she just, made a comment to me that totally changed it all and was like, no, you are a natural at this, just do it. And I finished. So um, actually my last semester before I student taught is when I was pregnant with Charlotte, my third one, I have four kids. Um, and I still remember walking all the way to the top terror, nine month, or top terror, it feels like a terror, tower in McFarland, um, three flights of stairs, nine months pregnant. I had to give my last presentation um, The teacher made sure I could give my presentation before I went into labor, and I literally went into labor that night. Um, So (laughs) I did all that. It was awesome. I loved student teaching. I was an L ed major, Um, loved elementary ed, but I also had my credentials in title, math, and reading. Um, And then I also did kind of a short little stint with, um, what am I trying to say, like advanced kiddos, gifted and talented program. There we go. This is Gregerson. Yeah. Um, Mrs. Zahn just let me know that, or Mrs. Zahn asked me to let you know she's on the way. Okay, thank you. So she <laughs> apologizes for being late in her meeting around late. So. That, that's all right. Thank you. Um, so anyway, yeah, I, I loved that led, but I also did a gifted and talented t- stint, which was really cool. Gifted and talented is a really neat thing, but we don't have a lot of those prog- programs around here. It's not a very common thing. Um, but honestly, gifted and talented is very similar to special ed. It's just the other way. Um, But a lot of the things that you do are very similar. Um, Then, actually, Mrs. Zahn is a relative of mine. Um, I used to sub here my first right out of um, school when I got done with my um, undergrad. And I would sub in the special ed rooms a lot up here. And I really loved it. I just had a good time with it. That teacher retired. um, And I found out about it. I was teaching in Jamestown at the time as an elementary teacher. Called Mrs. Zahn. And I'm like, am I even qualified to do this? I have no background in special ed. I, what do I do, right? Um, she's like, yes, you have an education degree. You can work on the special ed stuff. Um, so that's what I did. I got hired here in that position um, and went back to school while I was teaching and went to grad school and got my degree in special education, uh, my master's, and I specialize in emotional disturbance and learning disabilities. Um, and right now, actually, I'm getting my dyslexia um, credential as well. 
so I'll specialize in that. There are two right there. Um, so that's kind of my very long journey. Hello you to education. We just started. Um, You're probably fine. literally sitting out of my room. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of my very long journey to education. But yes. Yep, it ended with a call to Mrs. Zahn saying, can I even be a special ed teacher? And she was like, heck yeah, you can. So, and then we went from there. So yeah, so that's my giving our role background role into role education. Your, your journey into ed. education and your <laughs> current <laughs> position. Because I know you just Are did nice like, yeah. yeah, yeah, you're good, <laughs> you're good. <laughs> I ran up <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Right. Okay, so I'm Natasha Howard, if you do not know who I am. Um, I may look familiar to some or most of you. Um, so, mine is different. I am probably a very, um, oh gosh, I would say pretty rare case in um, the journey I took, I guess, until five years ago. Mm -hmm. But um, I, we were really encouraged to do job shadows in high school from our school counselor. We got, you know, you got two days off that didn't count against you, so it's like, you better use them, right? And so, and you could go wherever as long as you lined it up to have the right paperwork signed. And so, at the time, my boyfriend had an older sister that was graduating and going to school for speech pathology. And I said, hmm, that's interesting. Never heard of that before. And then, <coughs> um, I looked it up and I'm like, oh, wow, so-and-so and so-and-so. They would leave with that lady when we were in second grade. And then I, I, you know, thinking back... Um, when you reflect on how little moments of your life maybe change the course of your life. Um, I went to a really small school. We, I started kindergarten with 12 students in my class. And of those 12, I had a student with Down syndrome and a student with autism. And that was before autism even was a thing. I mean, you guys know what autism is. You've grown up with it. You've had classmates probably that very much so um, are open about their autism. That, I don't even know if that word existed even when I was in kindergarten, which I'm 33, so, you know, 27 years ago. Um, and so, looking back at that, I, at, um, the special ed teacher at the time pulled me in and gave me this little toy that I thought it was, and it's like, you're going to use this with Cole. And I'm like, okay, cool, it's a toy, I get to play with this kid. And it was a speech generator. It was how he could talk to me, how he could say drink, how he could say food, you know, to tell us what he wanted. And it wasn't until fast forward the 20 years later that I'm like, oh my gosh, that special ed teacher was already making me a speech therapist when I was five. <laughs> so it was pretty cool. <laughs> Anyways, so did my job shadow my senior year of high school, loved it. Um, declared my major at MSUM as a speech pathology major, and never looked back, did my four years of undergrad, did my two years of graduate school, graduated, and my first job was here with Cheyenne Valley. And so, um, some I get a lot of questions about this, especially from teachers who aren't from this area that now teach here. Um, they're like, well, what is Cheyenne Valley? <laughs> they're like, don't you just work for Valley City? And I'm like, no, not really. So. It's very common for smaller schools to work for a special ed unit. So the state is divided up into each of those and more of this. But anyways, I can work for five different school districts because of my position and maybe where safety needs me to go. And so I've been here, I've been at Washington, I've been at Jefferson, I have been at Barnes County North, and I have been at Hope Page, and I have been at Maple Valley. Um, and then we also serve Oaks. That's the only school I haven't found a place to be yet. So, <laughs> um, someday. So, yeah. Yeah, someday. <laughs> someday. Yeah, someday. <laughs> There's a cliffhanger there because. So then about, um, so as a speech therapist, um, I, you know, I started in the fall of 2013, um, worked at all the kinds of schools, and then kind of started working with a particular student with cochlear implants um, that needed a lot of um, specialized instruction, and then her deaf and hard of hearing teacher left, and Tracy called me into her office one day and said, hey, you know, you're already working with that student so much, 
you just want to be a deaf and have hearing teacher? <laughs> and I'm like, can I do that? <laughs> and and so allowed? then you can make anything happen. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, you can. Make you can. Story, you can make if it you happen. motivate, if there's me. anything you need to know, you can always <laughs> you make, can make it happen. <laughs> yes. So then I started researching because I am not someone that does not like to be prepared. And through my research, I found a program through the University of Nebraska um, that was offering free master's degrees for anyone that wanted to be a deaf and hard of hearing teacher. Ha! Master's degrees are not cheap. Not cheap. Okay? <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> and so I said, hey, Tracy, um, there's this program. I can get pretty much everything for free. Can I do it? I said, sure. <laughs> and then I did. Um, had had a child and got pregnant with another one during this. You moved that, houses too. And I moved. <laughs> so yeah, I moved it. houses. So um, my husband was in his master's degree at the same time. So it was chaos, but we worked through it and um, finished that degree in five semesters. And so now for the last four years, this will probably be my fifth in some capacity with the deaf ed part. I've been a primary deaf ed teacher and a secondary speech therapist. And so I'm sure we'll get into the, the what that actually yeah. means. Okay. So yeah. that's where I am currently. It's my last one, or is Mrs. Featherston here? Yeah, she, she wasn't able to make it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so just journey into education. Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah. And I'm assuming you have several other questions. They, so they have we, questions that they've okay, written. So I will <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, my journey into education, oh, first of all, I'm Tracy Zahn. I'm um, the director of special education for Cheyenne Valley Special Ed Unit, and we serve five total school districts um, for students with special ed services. So that means Valley City is our largest school district that we serve, <coughs> but um, I also hire and staff and place staff in Oak, Barnes County North, Maple Valley, and Holt City. And so, um, a well, majority of our staff actually just work in one district. So you might not even know like who are the Cheyenne Valley Special Ed staff because we don't walk around with like stickers on our forehead that says, I'm hired and paid for by some <laughs> other place. We don't do that. Um, but we do have some staff, which we call itinerant staff, and Natasha would be an example of that, that she travels you know, between school districts based on the need particularly just based on her specialty area. So, um, like our, um, I'm gonna pause because the question is, I might roll into <laughs> So, I grew up in Valley City and my mother was a first grade teacher. And I told her my senior year in high school that I wanted to be a music teacher. And because I loved music, I was a band geek and I, I just loved it. And she looked me in the eye and she said, no, you don't. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, I do, yeah, I do. And she said, she was a first grade teacher at that time and she's a really outstanding teacher. And she said, I, I just don't think you do, Tracy. It's a lot, I mean, my gosh, it's a lot of work. I said, no, but I know, I knew I wanted to work with kids and I knew I wanted to work in the schools. I, I just kind of knew that. It was just place I wanted to be. I liked school personally. My mom, I helped her correct papers on Sunday nights, you know, I, I got into that. And she said to me, well, you know, I, I work with this gal that's a speech, you know, Mickey Eisenstein, she's a speech pathologist, maybe you just want to observe her one day. And I'm like, okay. So, I mean, seriously, it was my senior year, I was flipping through back then, they had large career books. They didn't have such thing as the internet. <laughs> that old, really had that old. And I remember kind of flipping through this book and I was like, oh, speech pathologist. I went and observed Mickey. And what I noticed and I was drawn to is that she still got to work in the school. She still got to work with kids, but she got to work with them like one-on-one -on -one or small group, like not with 30 kids at a time because Back then, I had like 30 kids in my sixth grade class. I mean, it was a lot. And so then, not only is the classroom management or the discipline issues more manageable because you're one-on-one -on -one or small group, but you really got to know the students and establish a relationship with the students. So, 
I said, hey, this kind of looks fun. I'm going to be a sleep pathologist. And I am probably a rarity too because like Natasha, I went into college and I never changed my mind. I, ne I never looked back. Um, if I had to do it all over again, I would have probably gotten an elementary degree at the same time as speech pathology. But just so you know, speech pathology isn't something that, um, while, while we're under the umbrella of special ed, you don't only have to work in special ed. I mean, you could go hospitals, you can go rehab facilities, so you actually do this like medical placement and, and that. So, um, after I graduated with my master's degree in speech pathology, all at that same time, I was, um, I started working at the Open Door Center then in the summers, um, because I, um, and honestly, I will tell you that was the best learning experience I ever had, ever. And who would have thought at age 19 that that would be like one of the best learning experiences? And it was. Now, I mean, historically speaking, I have an aunt that has very significant developmental delays, and so it was always part of my life. My dad has a 90 decibel hearing loss, and so he has bilateral hearing aids. And so I was just around people with varying needs my whole life, and I didn't realize that a lot of people didn't have access to that. Like, they didn't know well, how to handle when their aunt slips out at Christmas dinner because the fork wasn't placed on the correct side of the table <laughs> because that's the way they do it at our group home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was our normal life. So, after I graduated with my master's degree, I got pregnant with twins, and so I took a little bit of time off, and I actually <laughs> subbed um, in the high school, and I actually worked very short period of time at Jamestown Hospital as a speech pathologist in the medical setting, and it was okay. I mean, I liked it, I, you, you know, but I went to a conference, and it was about, it was, you know, to get my credits that I still needed to renew my license or something, and it was an educational speech conference, and I'm like, oh, I, I just need to be in the school. So. I got my first um, school job at Central Cast, and I worked there for two years with middle schoolers and high schoolers. And let me tell you, I just really wanted to work with preschoolers. <laughs> and so that was a shock. Again, <laughs> fabulous, fabulous learning experience. Mm -hmm. I um, worked at Jefferson Elementary for 10 years um, with the preschoolers through grade three. On, in, in addition, or during that time, I also um, went ahead and I, well, I was supervised, I was up at Hope Page, I was kind of a tra uh, supervising speech pathologist at that time, too, and, um, and then I, eight years ago, I became the director of special education. It's quite parental that's the director of special education a very long time ago. And um, I, it wasn't my plan. It wasn't my plan, but I never like to feel like I'm stuck anywhere, ever. And so I can tell you, even with my still degree in speech pathology, I still have lots of options, and so I don't ever have to feel stuck anywhere. So, wanted to be a music teacher, talked out of that. Here I am. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, if you don't ever wanna feel like, I also hate having the same thing to do all day, every day, mm -hmm. and you will never have that in education, no matter if you teach the same subject every mm -hmm. class period, it's never the same. <laughs> right, so whether you're a regular ed teacher or whether you are a janitor in a school or whether you are a special ed teacher, I mean, or a specialist or something, no day is the same. And so if you are a person that has to have same routine, and we have schedules, don't get me wrong, we have schedules, but we, um, I mean, every day is a new adventure, I say, and you have to have a lot of flexibility. But I will say the biggest difference between regular education and special education, um, and I would say the biggest benefit that we get, I think in special ed it is fabulous, that we get to work with kids for more than one year. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you're a classroom teacher, you get first graders for one year. You get 10th graders for one year. You, mm -hmm. you might have an occasional student yeah. that you get two years. <laughs> But there is something so incredibly rewarding about seeing a kid and, and like grow and it's, it's just awesome, wouldn't you say? Yeah. 
That's that's the best part. And sometimes you have them for longer. Honestly, I mean, you had your student for what? Five years. Hey, some of my special ed teachers and some of my rural districts have them from preschool all the way through grade twelve graduation. Maybe that's too long, right? But (laughs) but really, you really get to know the students and establish Mm -hmm. that relationship. But even more importantly, you get to see their growth, Mm -hmm. and that is awesome. Yep, Mm -hmm. that's the best part. Okay. You guys are going to look through your sheets, see what they did not answer. <laughs> and all three of us really like talking, and so we won't be short it's of good. chat. That's so. good. Another reason we probably do you want to start? Do you want to start, Kayla? Oh, you want to start? Okay. Um, what are the main pros and cons of this? So I would say pros are I love hanging out with my kiddos, and I thought I was going to be like first grade max second grade kind of a teacher, right? I love middle school. I might be crazy, but I do love those little weirdos down there. They are hilarious. Um, And I would say my pros is is the relationship building in special ed. I would agree wholeheartedly with that. I'm a big relationship person. So I really love like getting to know my kids on that level. I love getting to have um, a lot of flexibility in my job. I am somebody who needs to be able to change on a drop of a hat. I, I kind of a fly by the seat of my pants kind of person anyway. Um, so I like that. The con is always in special ed paperwork. <laughs> There's just a lot of paperwork in special ed and it's it's necessary, you gotta do it, but it's not fun, I mean, but you have to do it. That is the biggest con I would say is, is that, <laughs> for me anyway. <laughs> um, biggest pro for me is um, on the deaf ed side of it, um, I'm dealing with kids who, um, you know, I will be with them forever because I'm the only deaf ed teacher here. So if they're deaf and they need services, it's going to me no matter what. And um, I get incredibly personal relationships with the child, the parent, the siblings, because it's a team effort to get these kids to where they need to be. Um, And then also, um, I'm challenged every day because um, I can have a kid come in with some neurological thing that I have never heard of, and I have to research it to feel like, oh, that's why when I want them to say a three-syllable word, it comes out them, mm-hmm. right? Right. I currently have mm-hmm. a child right now that I'm like, I need to talk to doctors. I need to talk to a neurologist. And you don't really think that you're going to be talking to a neurologist when you're sitting in a classroom working with a kindergartner, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. Um, so that medical side of things, for my position in general, for a speech therapist and the deaf ed, I'm talking to audiologists all the time. I literally got to see a kid here for the first time. That's pretty cool. I mean, <laughs> it was like, it's like what you see on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's real. <laughs> um, and then, but then this other side of it, and like where Tracy said, the speech therapy, you can work in um, hospitals with traumatic brain injury patients or people who have had strokes or um, that kind of thing. I have to, and some of my kids have. And so um, that also affects their ability to change. Um, con, yeah, paperwork. Um, and I would say another one for me is. <coughs> Sometimes you get crappy travel plans. Yeah. It just is. You don't want to send them. Uh, it's the honest truth, mm-hmm. and we can only control what happens in the eight hours that our children are with us. And so we do our darndest to make sure that they know they're loved, and know that they're supported, and that they have a safe place to come those five days a week. Mm-hmm. And what we just have to hope and pray that they come back the next day. Mm-hmm. That's the other. That's another. trying to think of pros and cons are different from what you guys have already said. <laughs> so pros, I mean, I, I would definitely say that, yeah, I mean, obviously it's that relationship piece. And, and and when I say relationship, I mean like really getting to know the students that you work with. The, um, you know, sometimes you have to, uh, I learned early on, you know, that I had to set those boundaries. So I, I mean sooner too. Um, but I would say a, a, 
pro there also is, um, I mean, obviously getting to see all of that progress that a student makes. Mm -hmm. um, the cons, aside from the paperwork, and I'm going to tell you there's paperwork in everything. <laughs> I mean, even in regular ed, yeah. you've got paperwork. You have more correcting probably yeah. than we do, but um, I think um, maybe it's a con. I don't know, maybe it's a pro, maybe it's somewhere in between, is that um, dealing with with very high emotions of, of families who are really truly advocating for their kids and understanding that and um, understanding their intention to see through their anger. And so I would say that isn't a on, that is, well, it might be a challenge. challenge for some people. Yeah. It is a definite mm -hmm. challenge for me mm -hmm. um, in my position, but even at other times, it was, it, it's always been a challenge. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Um, do you ever change the IEP for students? And if so, what goes into that? <laughs> We're always, always, We're changing always changing IEPs. those babies. Mm -hmm. So, IEPs also. I'm not sure if you guys have, have looked at this or not, but we, we have to update our IEPs at least once a year um, by law. And then every three years, we are required to take a look and see if we need to reevaluate the students. Um, so do we need to look at new things for programming needs? Maybe they don't need special ed anymore. Um, that's our goal. I, yeah, that's, that's a goal. goal. We, ideally, we're trying, as Tracy always tells us, we're trying to work ourselves out of a job. Our goal every day is to work <laughs> ourselves out of a job. Trying to work ourselves out of a job. Mm -hmm. um, but for example, I just held one where we needed to change her category. Um, she used to be this, and now she needs to be this because that's really where her need is lying at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so we up, and, and we can update IEPs at any time. We don't have to wait for the year. If we feel like we need to add something to the IEP because something's come up during the year, we're able to do that. Mm -hmm. So um, and it's a team process. It's a team thing. And yep. so. Um, a special ed teacher can't be the only person that changes an individual education plan, whether it's for programming or goals. Um, the parent has to be involved in that, as well as um, at least one regular ed teacher, if not more, um, an administrator, a building administrator typically. So yep, we would call a team meeting if there was something we felt like we needed to change. And anyone part of that team can call a meeting at any point in time. Typically, if we're going to go in and actually do that and change something, it's pretty significant. It's not like, oh, let's add that they need notes. <laughs> like, it's going to be something a little bigger, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that would be common. Mm -hmm. um, and this one is more for Tracy. Uh, if I get that, and this is uh, <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, how do you place a teacher in a specific classroom, and how does that process? Oh, that's a good question. So well, I'll take a couple different swings at that toy. So initially, so if I have a special ed positioning position open at like Washington School, like I did last year, okay, um, I have to. So we had three teachers, one quit, and so we still. I have to go look through all of our student needs to determine if we still really need three, or if we can get by with two, or maybe we need four or maybe we need one. So we do what's called like a needs assessment every spring where I meet with every building and we go through every student and their needs to determine what kind of specialized instruction that they need, okay? So then after that, I have to follow a negotiated agreement that our negotiated agreement says the first thing I have to do um, before I would advertise that position is to put it out there if what if Mrs. Sather wanted to transfer, right? Because she's already working for us. Maybe she wanted to transfer down to Washington Elementary. Mrs. Creviston did that a few years ago. If you guys remember Mrs. Creviston, she was up here and she actually transferred down to Washington. Um, so that's in our negotiated agreement that those teachers that are currently under contract would still ha would have that option first. Now, the hiccup in our negotiated agreement is that I don't, a person can request to transfer, but I don't have to honor it, the request. So ours is for 
pretty vague, but what I look at when I look at um, my job is to make sure that we have the best fit where they are, okay? So if I have somebody that is based on all of my observations, you know, and I spend a lot of time in classrooms, that they would not be a good fit for an elementary position, I do have the authority to say, no, I'm not going to honor that request to transfer. And that's really popular. <laughs> it goes over really well, I'm sure. But my whole goal, and I will tell parents this, and I tell my staff all know this, is that we have to fit the people, our teachers, with, with our students to the best of our abilities because that makes it a better work environment for our teachers and for our students, okay? Now, obviously I have to look at qualifications and all of that, but state licensure and qualifications um, have really changed a lot in the last 15 years in the state of North Dakota. It used to be that you had to, um, I mean, that you had to honestly have two degrees to even be a special ed teacher, and that isn't the case anymore. And so I, but I do consider that as well, when if so, um, if somebody has a, a lot of background in, in, you know, only training at the high school level, and they wanna go to the preschool classroom, I might consider that they're a great fit for that position, but I'm gonna know I'm gonna need to give them a lot of support and a lot of extra training to make sure that's a good fit for them. So that was a really long answer yeah. for, for that, but there, there's, a, there's varying multiples that, that I have to consider for that. And, and, then, mm -hmm. and, then, and then at all costs, who's, who's here? Yes, and then who's, who's available? available. <laughs> yeah, that is a real issue guys right now for example um, right now I have a special ed opening in Oak and it's a great job it's elementary it's like K3 and I haven't been able to fill it and so I have a sub right now and that I mean that is that is um, a huge con of my job is because we don't get to pick and choose who we educate in any public school you don't get to we don't get to pick and choose who who comes into our doors and we don't get to pick and choose um, who needs special ed services in our schools. So that means if we had 10 students that moved into Valley City that um, all required one-on-one -on -one paraeducator support and all individualized instruction, that I don't have a choice. I have to find a way to, to, to do that. And right now staffing is a huge huge issue. We're doing teletherapy for speech in three of our schools right now because we don't have speech pathologists. We haven't figured out how to clone you. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I mean, um, so I mean, that's, that's the other thing. And then the obstacle with that is, is that how do you ensure, so if you're short staffed some places, how do you ensure that you're not going to burn out your really good staff that are there? Because you don't want to keep adding stuff to their plate. And make sure the kids are getting what Right, and they're, what they're legally obligated to. If you were your younger self, what would you change about the role you're in today? I probably would have gone into it slightly earlier, mm -hmm. although mm -hmm. I do think the path I took also gave me a lot of other tools that people otherwise don't have. Mm -hmm. um, like when I, I, was a, I was a manager, um, I had to do a lot of conflict training because I was the one people came to when they were upset, right? Uh -huh. and I a lot of, you don't get that in teacher ed, and you get a lot of conflict. <laughs> and so I actually had a really good background in that in particular that I think was really useful to me. And I think I have a totally different appreciation for how administrators have to do things because I was kind of that person. And so I feel like I have a better idea of what life is like outside of education and how like, other people operate in the world because it's very, education is very unique in terms of how we get hired, how we're paid, how like all of those mm -hmm. kinds of things are very unique. It is not like any other job. Mm -hmm. And so I have a very different perspective too on when, when teachers maybe are upset about this, I'm like, okay, but that's not how that works in every other job mm -hmm. or vice versa. Like, hey, every other job gets this, why don't we get this? 
you know, and so it kind of gives me a very different mindset to some of that stuff, to be honest. So I don't know that I totally changed that, mm -hmm. but I would say I wish I went into it a little early. <laughs> I don't, but I don't think I would have really changed anything. It has being a parent and then doing this job has definitely given me better insight to um, where parent when I have a parent who's like. I'm asking them to do something that takes 10 minutes at home. I know how hard it is to get a three-year-old to sit down for three minutes, or 10 minutes now. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not asking my parents to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Just not. I think the only thing that I had mentioned before that, um, it, if I would have been, if I knew now what I knew, you know, didn't know then, I would have, um, I like school, I was pretty good at it, and I would have gotten an elementary education or even a special ed degree. And the only reason I say that is because um, when I was a speech pathologist in the public schools, I, I think it would have given me um, a little bit more, some other teachers might say to me, well, you've never been in a classroom before. Mm -hmm. You've never taught. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I would say, you're right, I haven't. You know what I mean? You're right, I haven't. So I think that perhaps that would have given me a good perspective and background, but also it would have also given me the, well, yep, I have, you know what I mean? Yes, I have. And so um, just for that, a little bit more of that knowledge base. Has there ever been times where you've just had to walk away from a situation? <laughs> <laughs> Every day. <laughs> But no, uh, <laughs> literally, um, I have learned with my, so I, one of my specialties is emotional disturbance and I honestly love those kiddos. I'm a little strange in that way. Um, I always say like, if you see the kids with their hoods flipped up, like flipping everybody off and pissed at the world, those are probably my favorite humans. Like those are my people. And I am not that person, <laughs> I'm like the opposite. I just really enjoy, um, trying to figure that kind of a kid out and, and what can you do to make your life better, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a, a problem solving thing with me, I think. Um, and in that way, I guess I just, I don't know, um, you do have to walk away from them though sometimes because they can get very intense um, and it can get very tough. And sometimes you have to pull yourself out of that and go, uh, this is my emotion coming out saying these things or choosing these things in this moment and I can't be doing that. My brain's not in a place to be saying or making those decisions and I have to step away from this for a minute so that we can come back and problem solve better um, because your emotions will fly very high, especially with parents. That's probably Tracy's biggest one would be my guess um, or working with staff who are upset and trying to truly hear what they have to say and not bring your own emotions into it and piece that together and go, okay, I hear what you're saying. I, I can see that. Now how do we move forward and how can we make this better? But there are many times you have to just be like, I need five minutes or I need until tomorrow to answer you because this is I'm not gonna answer in a good way right now or I'm not gonna act in the best interest right now, right? So yeah, definitely. And then just coming from the self-care side, I mean, since COVID, mm -hmm. we all are getting the SEL. For you guys are just getting it jammed down your throats, and it's important. Um, but there's a huge push for the professional side of it, of the self care too. Um, burnout's real, and it's real more so than ever probably. And giving yourself the grace to know that it's okay. Like it's okay that I might not see this kid for this whole 20 minutes today because if I go in more. I'm gonna do more hurt than good. Mm -hmm. And knowing that you need to be the best person at that moment, and maybe that means you need to shut your door and turn off the lights for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So I was thinking about, you know, I <coughs> definitely had to like walk away from, or, or step take a step back from a, a student, maybe an escalation. But I think I can honestly say that I have never walked away from an angry parent. Um, but what I do in those situations, um, an angry parent or an angry staff member, is that I, 
I just have to really stop and listen. And so I haven't walked away, but I really have to figure out um, when emotions run high and when people are angry, oftentimes the things they say are really nasty. But it, if you can get down to the, what their whole intention was or what they might be upset about. Um, I, I've had a lot of experience to, to hone those skills for myself and, and it's been a good op learning opportunity. I think that's hard, hard skill to learn. Mm -hmm. it, it, you learn about, a lot about yourself and yeah. how you manage conflict because you know what, no matter what career you go into, you're gonna Absolutely. run into conflict. And I think that is something that over time that you really learn a lot about yourself. And, and trust me, not everything you learn about yourself you're gonna like. Mm -hmm. And 99% right? of the time they're not <laughs> mad at you personally. Yeah, They're mad and you just happen to be the person who gets to hear yeah. about it. Cool. <laughs> so, yep, good question. <laughs> I'll tell you. Yeah. Okay. This is this is easy because I have it like to the minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, I leave my house anywhere from between seven and seven fifteen. I drive thirty five minutes to Cadet Elementary. Um, I have a prep period from eight thirty to nine. I on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. I do a two preschool group like pre like an actual preschool circle time for an hour from nine to ten. From 10 to 10.30, I see a girl with cochlear implants who is four for a half hour. Then from 10.30 to 11, I see a third grader who has cochlear implants for another half hour. 11 o'clock, I maybe see another preschooler who is checking all the boxes for autism. Um, see her for a half hour, I have a half an hour for lunch. I go and pick up another kid um, that's in second grade with cochlear implants for about 15 minutes to work on some grammar. Then I see, um, any other day I see a preschooler that's working on K's and G's or his S's or F's, um, work with them for 20 minutes. I get a bathroom break for about five minutes. I go see my um, third grader with cochlear implants for an entire hour again um, to work on language, math, um, grammar, speech, whatever it is that day that we need to work on. That gets me to two o'clock. Most days that's my long prep where I get a half hour. Um, then I see um, a kid oh, with apraxia who is five and only has about five functional words, so we're working on that for a half hour. Then I get to either see my kid with ED, which is emotional disturbance, who needs to work on ours, or I get to see another kindergartner who has the energy of like his two kids. <laughs> and then my day's over. And then on Fridays she comes. And then Fridays and I come with here. Too. Um, but that's that something. I mean, it's my day goes so fast because it's. I also work in a building that's like Washington. You all, got, most of you went to Washington. Long hallways, right? So my room is like where the music room is at Washington, and all of my kids I see are like in the gym. <laughs> so nowhere near so I room. walk, <laughs> I walk that hallway with those little tiny feet all day. So like I have a ten minute window between kids, but it takes five minutes for me to get them to my room. So you get really you get a lot of session. You get a lot of session. <laughs> but yeah, it's yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So that's my day. And then I just a quick announcement. Lunch A and B will be in the cafeteria today. Can I get the following students to the junior high office? Brody Stocker, Noah Moore, Quincy Corbin, Carter Jewett, Isaac <coughs> Abramson, <coughs> and Ryland Scrampton to the junior high office. Just because I want to make sure that we yeah. get to this, yeah. can we, and rather than us all answering yeah. that, can we make sure, is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this one might be short, but do you ever get grades from your job? Sure. Any job. I think honestly, any true. job. Yeah. Any job. Um, what's your favorite thing to teach? My hobby is to teach my hobby. Mm, good question. Movement, big one. That's for sure the most. Like, mm -hmm. it's you can't expect a kid to sit like you're sitting for. <laughs> you know, you can't expect you to sit for that long sometimes. Mm -hmm. and so movement's a big one for me. Mm -hmm. I <coughs> really love to teach life skills. I like to teach the life skills. 
I love history, but I never get to teach my kids history, to be perfectly honest with you, because our history teachers are fabulous up here, and they can just go with the classroom. So unfortunately, I never get to hit that. I actually really hate, on the opposite side, teaching like math and science. And those are probably the two things I teach all the time. I've been able to divvy out math. I enjoy science now, because I get to work like in Mrs. Gregor's. I get to teach with a science teacher now. That makes it way more fun, because um, I was not a science lover in school. Um, but I also really love to teach social skills. I like to work with my kids and help them figure out how to work with other people, how to manage their emotions, um, all of that kind of stuff. Um, that's, that's also a really fun thing to teach for me. Mm -hmm. When I was a speech pathologist, I really liked, and to this day, the one thing I miss about being a speech pathologist is I really liked teaching the R sound. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm going to tell you that because it is really hard to teach an R sound. It is. But I got really good at it. And I and I do. I miss that. But um, I, I agree with Katie with the, you know, the, I would really like those life skills. You know, I know a lot of kids go through high school and they're like, oh, I mean, I've got kids. They're like, I got to learn how to do these kinds of equations. I'm never going to use this in my life, right? Or certain things that you're trying to understand the value and how it might apply to you as an adult. And so um, that is, I really enjoy getting um, to work on those things and those, even like the social skills and those important things that just make you a, a better human and communicator, you know, with, with adults. And, and I see I'm in a lot of interest like, in my room. Yeah. Yeah. Mine's, a, mine's that moment, it's not necessarily a certain thing. But it's that moment where the light bulb goes on, like to your point where you're like, do you ever feel drained? Yeah, we do. But it takes one kid, but that's one why moment. Say it. <laughs> Sometimes where they've been kid. working on R for two years and you want to bash your head through a wall and you're like, why won't they just say the R sound? <laughs> yes, that one moment when the kid says the sound that we're working on or that one moment where you can say a sentence with an is in it. And you're like, yes, proper grammar. <laughs> Thank you. Next, so next semester they do their field experience. So, yep. yeah, yeah, we'll be making sure they. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Awesome. Thank you guys so much.